In this video, we're going to discuss two additional barriers to effective problem solving, mental set and unnecessary constraints. Mental set is when people try to continually use a problem solving strategy that worked in the past. The reasoning is usually along the lines of, well, this solution worked for this problem, so why won't it work for other problems? You better understand how this works, let's take a look at it in an example. And we're gonna revisit the water jar problem. So just to remind you, in the water jar problem, a person is presented with three empty jars. The three jars can hold different volumes of fluids. So for example, in this first trial, you have jar A that can hold 37 cups of water, jar B that can hold 12 cups of water, and jar C that can hold five cups of water. Your task is then to figure out how can you exactly measure a goal volume, which in this case is 10 liters. What you're allowed to do is you can fill the jars and empty the jars with water as many times as you want. Okay. So let me take a look at this and see if you can figure it out. And if you've watched our previous video, then you know the solution is to first fill jar A, so you have 37 cups of water, pour it into jar B, so that gets rid of 12 cups of water, leaving you with 25 cups of water. If you then pour it into jar C, you can remove five cups of water. And if you do that three times, that will get rid of 15 cups of water, leaving 10 cups of water in jar A. So we can write the solution as you fill jar A, you pour it into B, and then you pour it into C three times, and that will give us our goal volume. We can now try this with another trial, trial two. It's the same type of problem, except the jars can hold different volumes of water. Jar A can hold 43 cups, jar B, 9 cups, and jar C, 4 cups. And your goal here is to measure out 22 cups of water. Okay, so again, you can give it a try. What happens to most people is that trial 1 takes them some amount of time to figure it out. It's not that simple of a problem. However, trial 2, they're able to do faster. And that's because the first thing they think of is, well, this solution worked, why don't I just try it again? Right, if I fill jar A with 43 cups of water, if I pour that into B, that gets rid of nine cups of water, so I'm left with 34 cups of water. If I pour it into C three times, that's gonna get rid of four cups of water three times, or 12 cups of water. Well, that'll leave me with 22 cups of water, which is exactly what I'm looking for. So they're going to be able to solve trial two faster. The same approach worked. So now let's take a look at trial number three. As it turns out, trial number three is going to be the same. You can take 24 cups of water in A, pour that into B to get rid of four cups of water. That's going to give you 20 cups of water left in A. If you pour into C three times, that will get rid of nine cups of water, leaving you with 11 cups of water that you want. So it's the same solution. And it makes sense. They're gonna get faster at solving it. What's fascinating though is what happens when they come to trial four. And in this case, if you wanna participate, feel free to pause the video and see if you can solve trial four on your own. What's interesting is that Trial four is actually easier than any of the other trials. However, after solving trials one, two, and three, most individuals are gonna have a really tough time with trial four. It's gonna take them a long time, and that's because they keep trying to use the same approach of, okay, well, let me fill jar A, I have 35 cups of water. If I pour into jar B, I'll have 22 cups of water. And then if I pour that into jar C three times, well, that will leave me with 10 cups of water, which isn't what I'm looking for. And then they get stuck. What am I supposed to do, right? And if you actually look at this question, it's actually quite simple. You can simply fill up jar B, then pour it into jar C, and that'll leave you with nine cups of water in jar B. So arguably, trial four is the easiest, but because of mental set, people can struggle to solve this last trial. All right, so this is mental set. Let's now take a look at unnecessary constraints. 
This is when individuals assume that there are rules that don't exist. So to better understand how this works, let's look at this example. You've probably seen it before, where you have to connect all nine circles using four lines. So here are the nine circles, and you have four lines that you can use to connect all of the circles together. Now, the problem with most people when they get to this problem is they come up with this unnecessary constraint, right? And that unnecessary constraint is that most people think that there is a barrier around the circles. And this barrier around the circles can't be crossed. Right? So if you try it yourself, you can just look at it. Well, how can I draw four lines and possibly connect all nine circles? And as it turns out, it's impossible if you have this unnecessary restraint. So what can be very helpful for a lot of these cases where you're solving a problem is to literally think outside the box. All right, so if we think outside the box and don't pretend that there is this barrier around this box, then you might arrive at several solutions. For example, you could draw one line like this. You could draw a second line like this, although I maybe should have drawn that a little better. And then I can draw a third line like this. So in this case, I only use three lines and I'm able to connect all nine circles. There's another approach that you can take too, right? For example, you can draw one line like this, one line like this, one line like this, and then one line like this. So you can see how you've used four lines and you've connected all nine circles. So for both of these solutions, you can't have used this unnecessary constraint that there is this border around the nine circles that you cannot cross. So this is how unnecessary constraint works.